Howdy friends, Pete here. Just wanted to share yet another letter, the third letter that I wrote to my friend and hopefully your friend, Dio Odalecki, who's currently caged in Parma, Ohio for uh, essentially not complying with police employees. Dio didn't harm anybody, he didn't vic victimize anyone, he didn't aggress against anyone's property. Uh, it's unjust that he's being caged. He, it's, I think, accurate to call him a political prisoner. Um, but my intention in writing these letters and in sharing them is, again, just to put his situation on your radar. And if you're somebody who, you know, still doesn't see through the violence that's inherent in this injustice system, to maybe uh, become familiar with Dio's situation and see that his actions uh, are definitely not um, cause for him to be caged. And so, uh, without further ado, I'm just going to read this letter to you. Okay, this letter is dated April 2nd, and it reads, Dio, Douglas, Uncle Dio, my friend, I hope you find many reasons to smile and laugh today. I'm not sure if you have a window, and if so, what you can see, perhaps a bit of nature. I've found sometimes that by stopping and just soaking in all that's around, growing or flying or crawling, can be both entertaining and thought-provoking. When last year we were out in the Cali Desert, living in an RV, I recall a little ant colony and how entranced I was watching them seemingly unguided yet purposeful their purposeful actions of hundreds and thousands of ants. I also saw and was quite startled by a fluorescent yellow slash clear scorpion that had found shelter under a tarp we used as a sunshade. I later saw a second scorpion months later when in Utah. They certainly aren't too prevalent breed at all here in the Shire. Things like the simplicity but complexity of the ants or a plant cause me to wonder and ponder the big picture, why we are here, who exactly is we and I, and why do I seem to have innate beliefs or think of some things as good and others as bad and more. I could go on at length about these and other related thoughts, but I'll spare you. I'd guess that you have had similar threads in your own mind, especially as of late with the unjust physical caging removing as options certain things you'd otherwise occupy your time and mental processes towards. Perhaps in that sense, it's like a silver lining. You can emerge mentally stronger. Last night I was able to meet and roll around with our friends involved with Lehigh Valley Cop Lock and Allentown Cop Lock. They came to the Shire for a few days. On Wednesday they broadcast the Cop Lock radio show from the Free Talk Live studios, which sounded like a great experience. I enjoyed hearing of their own paths and what was identified as being integral to who they, they today choose to be or are. For example, the confidence that came and is now present after learning more about their own rights and connecting with others of like mind and in being guided by the goal to make the world a better place. We all found some common ground on the linchpin of taking care of oneself, finding that balance as well. One motivation for me to pin this letter was my desire to share with you the text of the letter written by Jeffrey Tucker and sent to Ross Ulbricht, as I see parallels and hope you can find some solace in the words. Tucker also shared the text on fee.org, which is how it came onto my radar. I know you're familiar with Ulbricht's plight. Like you, his actions peacefully delegitimize the parasitic class, those who subsist on the wealth others create. So in order to try to protect their charade, Ulbricht and you are now caged. But difficult as it may now be to see, you are both having significant positive repercussions. And as Tucker noted to Ulbricht, the rebels always exist, and thank goodness for that. Otherwise, there would be no such thing as human progress. So, in its entirety, here is Tucker's correspondence with Ulbricht. The post online is dated March 25th, 2016, and is titled, Dear Ross Ulbricht, a letter on his 32nd birthday and begins Dear Ross, happy birthday. It's impossible to say hope all is well to a great man and justly imprisoned by the state, so I'll skip the pleasantries. We've not met, but I've followed your work for many years. We have a shared interest in human rights, freedom, and the beautiful anarchy of digital spaces. Starting around this time, we both developed the conviction that this would be our future, and we were impatient for it to get here.
One hundred years of a failed administrative state is more than enough. As the innovator of an online market that operated outside political constraints and even with the use of private money, you were ahead of your time. And you have experienced what so many other visionaries in history have experienced. Prison is too often the fate of the principled and brave enough to see a future of freedom beyond the regime of the moment. It should not be this way. In so many ways, your life right now is a stand-in for every dreamer in the world who has run afoul of the reactionary spirit of the powers that be. The way you have been treated, however, changes nothing about the trajectory of history. Freedom will eventually win this struggle, and this is for three reasons. First, innovations cannot be stopped, even by the world's most powerful governments. Second, technological knowledge today is global, weightless, and as reproducible as ideas themselves, which makes it finally impossible to control. Third, while the state can coerce the body and material property, the human mind cannot ultimately live in a cage. And this is what strikes me as most tragic about your plight, that you have to be sentenced to two plus lifetimes for running a website changes nothing about the long run. You have been treated brutally and denied a fair trial. So too are the greatest heroes from the classical world to the modern times. And your plight robs humanity of your creative contributions. Even so, power in this instance will lose. All the resources spent to put you behind bars have been wasted. Someday everyone will understand this, just as people today understand this about Socrates, Galileo, Martin Luther King, and Nelson Mandela. I'm not sure if you had followed the great struggle between the U.S. government and Apple, the world's most valuable company. The CEO, Tim Cook, has taken a brave and heroic position. He has refused to comply with the FBI demand that the company's programmers hack their operating system's encryption to make a backdoor for the state. Cook says that this would create an inferior product. Encryption is necessary to protect data from being pillaged by cyber criminals. Isn't it ironic? It is increasingly difficult to distinguish the intentions of cyber criminals from that of the government itself. They are both on the same side of lining up against the interests of the human right to liberty and property. I'm so proud of Apple for resisting. So intense in public was its statement of principle that the FBI even backed down while trying to save face. <clears throat> they withdrew the lawsuit and claimed they would hack it themselves. Maybe. Regardless, this was a victory for the good guys. When Edward Snowden first revealed that the NSA, FBI, and so on were sucking data out of the Google's and Apple's servers through a back door, we all wondered just how complicit these companies were in the surveillance. Many people were angry at the private sector for going along, if they were. I was sympathetic with Apple and Google. They faced a gag order in any case, and, and these can be very scary. Apple's innovation was the best answer. They would make a system so secure that not even Apple itself would have access. Brilliant. It's not even clear to me that the FBI fully understands what they were demanding of Apple. It's a form of nationalization, really, not altogether different from the nightmare scenarios of interventions you find in Atlas Shrugged, that we are talking about operating systems rather than oil wells and steel factories make it less obvious but no less significant. In some ways, this new battle mirrors the old struggle over PGP in the 1990s. Remember that? The creator Phil Zimmerman was called complicit with terrorism and the code itself treated as a weapon that was illegal to export. MIT heroically responded by publishing the entire code in book form. The government relented, and thank goodness. Can you imagine what the digital world would be today had encryption technology been successfully banned? A million innovations since would have never happened. Even today, without encryption, there would be a privacy apocalypse. And yet, that is exactly what the government's positions favors. So many people in the tech community follow this Apple case closely. What if the company lost in court? Its programmers would have been ordered by the government to wreck their own software. Amazing. Would the code slingers go along? Most people who know this community well seriously doubt it. They would likely pick up and go work for another company and take their innovations with them. If need be, they will work outside the jurisdiction of the U.S. government. As for Apple itself, the latest news is that the company will begin to manufacture its own servers rather than ordering them through the regular supply chain. Why? Because they worry that their servers will otherwise be compromised in transit. 
Can you imagine that it has come to this in the United States that a company has to forgo the advantages of the division of labor and trade just to maintain the security of its own property? Amazing. Why does the government continue to fight these battles that it is sure to lose eventually and tolerate such carnage along the way? I suppose that it is the great mystery of the ages. It has something to do with the unwillingness of some people to tolerate freedom. Powerful people want to exercise that power and they are greatly offended when principled people say no. They are forever sending messages and making examples of people do not defy us. And yet the rebels always exist and thank goodness for that. Otherwise there would be no such thing as human progress. I don't know if you follow the politics in the U.S. over the last year. I've ignored politics for most of my adult life and dangerously threw myself into it over the last year. What a shock. It's amazing to see throngs of people cheering and clamoring for their own enslavement, treating would-be oppressors as liberators. It's true that both the rise of Trump and Sanders are a response to the remarkable failures of the establishment and the attempt to use the state apparatus to forge certain social outcomes they deem important. People today readily recognize that something is profoundly wrong. The system is grafting, violent, corrupt, wasteful, ineffective, and is driving down the American prosperity and injuring the freedom that people feel is their birthright. However, while the average voter intuits the problem, they don't clearly discern the source, the state, and thus are vulnerable to demagogues redirecting their anger in strange directions to foreigners, wealth inequality, etc. At this stage of the system's meltdown, the proposed solution these candidates offer are worse than the disease. Hate is on the loose and directed everywhere. Those who today approach politics with cool-headed reason are being pushed aside. This puts the cause of freedom in an awkward position of fearing democracy as much as the ruling class itself fears it. I'm wondering if there is a silver lining here. The best and most poignant attack one can make on despots of the left and right is to draw attention to the ways in which their agendas attack the core of human rights and liberties. Maybe their rise will awaken people to certain fundamental truths. Maybe we'll see a rediscovery of the body of, I of ideas that have been such a central driving force in your life of that deep need that exists in all of us to be free from arbitrary force of any sort. Leonard Reed in the 1950s, after he started the Foundation for Economic Education, put a great deal of thought into finding the core of the philosophy that built civilization. He represents an ideal we should all keep in mind. He liked the idea that law should limit itself to intervening only when people face violent attacks on their person or property, otherwise society should leave people alone. His slogan was simple, anything peaceful. As time goes on, I've come to appreciate the wisdom of this simple phrase. We don't know the results of human liberty. We can imagine the unknown blessings that await us when we let the human mind imagine freely and allow people to test new solutions to human problems. This is precisely why we need the freedom to improve the world. I recall that when you started your experiment, you were driven mainly by curiosity. What would be the results? Could this actually work? Could a coherent and self-policing commercial community be created in the cloud? You should have received the Nobel Prize for what you demonstrated. You proved that it could happen. Freedom can work where cartelism and despotism has failed. I know that there is no real solace for you, even with confidence that you will someday be widely seen as the visionary you are. I can't even imagine what you may be going through, and yet everyone who has spoken with you says that you are maintaining your spiritual strength. You are teaching, reading, learning, forming friendships, even in the worst possible conditions. All respect, my friend. It is extremely difficult for people who have never been in your position to understand the spiritual crisis that comes with being locked away. Those people who love you deeply are on the outside and have no control over how you are treated. Those who manage your life and determine your fate do not value you for who you are. It would be extremely easy under these conditions to give up, to forget your principles, to consider your values and personality to be irrelevant. There is surely the ongoing temptation to think of yourself as others who control you think of you. This must be your major challenge. You have had to look deep within to find strength, remember your purpose in life, and remain mindful of what really matters. 
In sustaining your spirit and your love of life, liberty, and learning, you are a deep inspiration to us all. Again, happy 32nd birthday. I wish you all the best. I and so many others are thinking of you every day. Sincerely, Jeffrey Tucker. And then I just said, much love, Dio, with a little smiley face. As always, Dio's mailing address is included in the video description, as are a couple links about Anthony Novak, another Parma resident who's being targeted by the Parma police outfit. Mr. Novak created a Facebook page, and for that, these folks with badges uh, are trying to get Mr. Novak caged for a while. So I encourage you to check that out, and if you're in or around Parma, uh, definitely question the people who are responsible. And uh, again, feel free to send Dio some love through a letter if you have the time. Peace.